And we're back. Uh, I just saw someone had missed the bonus code from the previous session because of a lag issue. So I'm going to throw that out there again. It is compensation. But continuing on the topic of money and finances, I'd like to introduce a good friend of ours who has contributed so much content over the years through articles, guides, videos, and interviews. It's our good friend, Adam Schmeya. We've done many of these live at Vision Expo, and they are always, or were always, some of the most popular sessions. Uh, so Adam, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I know you've prepared a presentation, so I'm going to just turn it over to you so you could jump right in, and I'll uh, catch you back when you're done. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me for today's presentation in which I want to teach you and share with you what I've learned in coming up on 14 years of consulting with ODs around the country, the top 10 tips for financial freedom for optometrists. Now, the younger that you are, the more uh, the, the more beneficial I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about here today is going to be, but that does not certainly negate the importance of understanding these principles and concepts regardless of where you're at in your wealth building journey. The classic uh, Chinese proverb that comes to mind is when's the, be when's the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? When's the next best time today? Uh, a lot of those principles are, go or, I, or I should say that principle is going to be uh, Im impressed upon and we're gonna talk about kind of the, the context around that uh, throughout today's presentation. So my name is Adam Schmela. brief introduction on myself. I am a certified financial planner. I'm a third generation business owner and, and my wife is an optometrist. So I joke with people that I'm about as uh, in tune with optometry as one can be without actually having OD after their name. I'm also the host of the 2020 Money Podcast. And, and so the, the goal of what I do with optometrists is to help them understand that both the combination of their time and the income that they can generate as a practicing optometrist is the greatest wealth building tool that you have. Everything in wealth building, everything in wealth creation comes down to time and, and the decisions that you make with your money. And my goal in today's presentation is to teach you the 10 concepts, 10 principles that you can take with you as you, as you continue down your journey as an optometrist, regardless of what side of that business that you're on as an associate, or as a practice owner. A few disclosures, right? A lot, but please don't, basically everything on the screen can be summed up. Please don't make any of your overall financial life decisions based solely on a one uh, 25 to 30 minute presentation. So with that, uh, what I would consider to be common sense disclosure, let's get this out of the, let's get that out of the way and then get this out of the way as well, which basically I'm gonna have you drinking from fire hose today with some concepts and some ideas, and it's gonna be high level. What we're gonna be talking about here today is again, going to give you some ideas and some things to consider as to how that applies to your own situation. And then my goal is to equip you with the, with the next action items that you can take to think about how you execute on a lot of what we're gonna talk about here today. So with that being said, let's get right into the first, uh, into the first topic here. So what we're gonna be talking about here is becoming brilliant at the basics. And what I mean by that, remember I said earlier, everything comes down to cash flow. But what I wanna do is, I, that sounds conceptual in nature, but let's kind of drill that down and just take an example from an optometrist standpoint, let's take a, a recent graduate or so, let's take the, the industry standard $120,000 of gross income per year for an, for an employed optometrist. And let's just kind of run through this math and see how this actually translates into the wealth building material or the wealth building tools, I should say, that you're going to have as an optometrist. So... Let's say that you agree with a lot of what I'm going to talk about here today, and I, I've kind of changed your mindset. We're going to have your savings habits dictate your spending habits. So you're going to get really aggressive, and you're going to shave off $19,000, $19,500 off the top line of your revenue. You're going to contribute that to a pre-tax traditional 401k. And so that's going to leave you with $100,500 per year. Now let's take, let's just assume that we're taking federal, state, local taxes, social security taxes, all of those taxes, right? That as new as as students, we really haven't been used to paying those because either you're living completely on student loans, which is non-taxable income, or your income was such even as a college student that maybe your standard deduction completely wiped out any type of taxable income. So at best, maybe you were paying 7.65% in Social Security and Medicare taxes. But now that you're practicing fully employed, if we add up all those things, let's say that we have a 30% tax rate, 
Well, that now leaves us with $70,350 per year to spend, but we have those little things called student loans, which the vast majority of optometrists coming out of school have to pay back. So let's say that the average student loan payment, let's say it's maybe $1,500. I remember when my wife got first got out of optometry school, she graduated from IU back in 2011. Her monthly payment was $1,716. She came out with a little bit more in, or in total student loan debt from both undergrad and optometry school. So $1,716 per month was her student loan payment. So let's just say that we have $1,500 a month, 12 months out of the year, $18,000. Now we're at $52,350 of annual after-tax income, or $43.62 per month. But what's missing from this equation, right? Life, right? <laughs> There's a lot more that's listed that, that we haven't accounted for here yet that still needs to be taken into consideration. Your rent, your mortgage, or rent or mortgage, right? Transportation, food, entertainment. And I joke with people that life never gets less expensive or less complicated, uh, uh, as each chapter of our career evolves. So uh, my point in all of this is that it is so important to become good stewards of the wealth and of the income that you're going to be earning as an optometrist. And the habits that you form now are going to, in large part, dictate the financial success and to an extent, the career success. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in today's talk uh, going forward. So what I want you to do is think about and, and, and tie the concept of monthly cash flow to understanding in long term or in, in the big picture how money works. So there's this little thing called compounding interest. Albert Einstein said that uh, compounding interest was the eighth wonder of the world. It never really got the credit that it deserves. So basically, this chart shows three different individuals. I always called them uh, Prudent Polly, Procrastinating Pete, and Consistent Chris. So Prudent Polly, even though the names are here are different, that's the alliteration that I always used in my mind. Basically, what we can see here is that consistent Chris, that light, that light blue line, shows Chris investing $5,000 every year between the ages of 25 and 65. In total, he invests $200,000, never stops, and we're assuming an 87% rate of return on the investment turns into $1.4 million, or $1.1 million, right? 200 in ends up with 1.1. What I want to draw your attention to here, though, is the difference between Susan and Bill, right? Bill or procrastinating Pete, in my, in my example, decides that, you know, he gets out of college and he just decides, you know what, I'm going to live life. I'm going to take that trip. I'm going to buy that car. I'm going to buy this house. And I'll get to that thing called savings at some point down the road. And he waits 10 years, right? So Susan, on the other hand, in this situation, decides to just get after it right away. She starts saving $5,000 annually. For the next 10 years, she invests $50,000. The funny thing here is that even though she invests a third of what Bill, or to think of it differently, right, Bill has to invest three times the amount that Susan had to invest, he never ends up catching up to Susan. And this is how, this is, if there's one thing that you take away from today's conversation, it's that the law of compounding interest can take a long time, sometimes decades to show up and really start to feel the impact. If we take a long linear 7% 7, 7 compounded rate of return, it takes a while for this concept, for this principle, for the math to show up in your account values. But not understanding it and not, and not appreciating the importance of compounding interest in the, in the overall goal of wealth creation is one that I, I tell people, the, with every candle that you put on your birthday cake, time and money become more of your enemy than they become your ally. And so the quicker that you understand this concept and trust in the process, trust in how investing, excuse me, how investing works, trust how wealth creation works, the sooner that you can form these, these habits, the better off you're going to be over the long term. So throw a little, a little lighthearted humor in here to make my point. Uh, I hope that out of all the slides that I'm going to go through here, that one very boring, basic, but very impactful slide makes my point. Uh, you have to start now. Now, all of that may be all fine and dandy, but if we don't have a good solid financial foundation in place, we don't want to build a financial house of cards. So having really good insurance is absolutely critical. Now, I'm not a licensed insurance agent. I don't sell insurance as an agent. This, is not, this isn't a commercial for to, to buy insurance from myself or any other agent. It's a matter of just understanding the principles that protecting your greatest wealth building tool, which is your income, starts with having good insurance, good disability insurance. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can check out episode 42 of 2020 Money, where we talk a lot about the ABCs and 123s of disability insurance. On the life insurance side of things, we're really focused on vast majority of optometrists out there 
buying good level premium, level term insurance is going to be a great risk management, a great insurance solution. There are exceptional situations where doing some type of permanent insurance can be beneficial or can be utilized, but the vast majority of ODs are going to be well served in getting good term insurance in place. So make sure that before you start getting all crazy with the investment side of things, that you understand the foundations of a good financial plan, which start with having good protection planning in place. Next on that list, going back to my going back to my example of where the cash flow, right? If we as we go through that, through basically your own personal P and L, right? If you think of your household just like any other business, you're a business. You have top line revenue coming in, you have expenses, you have your opex, your operating expenses, and then you have hopefully net income, which is savings. My idea is to take that savings and right let that dictate your spending habits. So. One of those line items on that list was your student loans. Now, again, I'm, I'm joking here in that I know that this is a big, big, big to-do item on a lot of ODs lists. And some of what I'm going to talk about here today, especially given the current environment that we're in right now with the student loans, current the federal student loans, excuse me, currently being in forbearance due to the COVID, uh, due to various COVID pieces of legislation that have been passed over the last 18 months or so, that some of these action items maybe are sitting in the wings, you might not be acting on them right now, but here's some basic do's and don'ts. Basically know what you owe, know what kinds of loans you have and start paying as soon as you get a job, which translates on the, on the side of things. You don't necessarily have to wait that six months. That asterisk is there again, given the current situation that we're in. It can make sense if you're in the federal system and you're not accumulating interest and you don't have any payments and you're not accumulating interest, it makes more sense to accumulate that cash and then potentially before this forbearance period ends, which as of this recording, it's slated to end in um, uh, at the end of September, 2021, it may make sense to look at either refinancing your student loans under the private sector or possibly consolidating them. Either way, if you're gonna do that, it may make sense to take a good chunk of money and dump that on your student loans to reduce that balance. Again, this is where I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of that picture of Everest and, uh, and the fire hose, right? Don't, and the disclaimer page, don't take what I'm saying here purely in isolation and act only on this alone. Um, but my point is here on the, on, the, on the federal side of things, understand that if you're going to go for forgiveness, that there are those forgiveness, option, forgiveness options out there, right? If you stay in the federal system, if your loans are being serviced by Fed loans or any other federal loan borrower service or provider, you have the option of either going on the IBR, which is the income-based repayment plan, the pay or repay options. Now, in order to do that, you have to go through a certification process. Basically, they're gonna calculate your um, you, you, the amount of discretionary income above the poverty level. There's, there's, again, deeper calculations and determinants that go into deciding whether or not that's going to be the option. Here's our very general rule of thumb. If your total outstanding balance relative to your income is more than, let's call it 130%, then it will make more sense potentially, again, future earnings come into consideration here, future spousal income comes into consideration, but just you know, myopically looking at your situation right now, 130% loan to income ratio, looking at the one of the income forgiveness options, typically it's gonna be pay or repay, are going to be in your, in, in your favor. If not, then our recommendation is to get aggressive, possibly refinance your student loans and pay, off, pay those off as quickly as possible. The reason that we do that is because we find people getting caught in this messy middle. They get caught in kind of a financial planning purgatory where they're, they're, they're on one side of their balance sheet. They're not getting aggressive and paying down their loans. Maybe they're making the minimum payments or a couple hundred extra per month. And then they're trying to do the 401ks and Roth IRAs and HSAs. And then they have kids and then they buy a house and, they're, and all these things take dollars from their paycheck. And there's not, when you spread all that out, there's not a whole lot left over to really make a lot of impact on any one category or any one line item on their profit loss. So if you're going to pay off those student loans, the better and more aggressive that you can get, the better off you're going to be. Pull In order to find out the totality of what you own, pull your file from the NSLDS database. This is the same website in the National Student Loan Database. Go ahead and pull that. Uh, it's the same website that you pulled your FAFSA from. Just Google NSLDS and you'll be able to pull your... Uh, Pull your fat or pull your student loan uh, information there. It comes as a TXT file, so it's not very pretty to see. If you're really good with Excel or you're really good with another spreadsheet, you can import that into that. If there are not, there are other student loan providers out there that have calculators that you can you can connect with one of those and help them interpret that data. But that's where you're going to get a list of all the different pieces of. Um, 
all the different loans that you have. So next, assuming that we have that under control, this is the hierarchy in which I would encourage you to think about investing. Get that cash reserves. Emergency reserves is money in the bank, on the side, in case of emergency, this is what we're gonna pull from. Then I want you to go to the retirement plan, simple IRA, 401k, whatever retirement plan is sponsored in the practice that you're working in, put up to the match. Simple IRA is typically going to be 3%, 401k is in an optometry practice is typically going to be 4% get that match, then go into an HSA if you have it. An HSA is kind of like a retirement account, but only available if you have a, a high deductible healthcare plan. Then we're going to look at the Roth IRA, then profit sharing, and finally any after tax, uh, after retirement funding, we're just going to put into a normal brokerage account, low cost, low tax implication investments. That's the hierarchy of where and how much to invest. Next, what I want to think about, remember I said in the beginning, your greatest wealth building tool is your income. The best way in which you can increase your income is to negotiate with your employer, right? If you're an associate that's working in a practice, and please, here's, here's what I don't want you to do. Don't go to your employer and say, I'd like a raise. Because I can promise you as a business owner, that doesn't necessarily feel that good. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to get a raise. I'm happy to share in the, in the financial success of the team members that we have, but I want it to be a rising tide. I want that rising tide to lift all boats. So if you're going to negotiate, make sure that you understand what you're bringing to the table and how the practice center can benefit by paying you more money or how you can directly and materially participate in basically creating your own raise, which leads us into the win-win scenario, right? Make sure that you're taking into consideration what you're going to be worth and how to communicate that and be confident in that. For example, from a comp, from a from a production standpoint, if you're on a base plus uh, scenario, maybe your salary is a is a flat salary up to fifty up to fifty thousand dollars of production per month, and then uh, for every dollar over over that fifty thousand dollars, you're getting fifteen percent of gross receipts, or gross collected, right? Not produced, but collected. There's a big difference. Uh, so maybe it's fifteen percent, seventeen percent, fifty, uh, thirteen, right? Whatever that dollar amount is, there is the base for you, right? That's a certain guarantee that you have, but then there's upside potential because guess what? The practice owner in that example is going to be participating in a profit center as well because their profit margin on that gross revenue above $50,000 versus what they pay you in, like I said, 13, 15, 17% of gross receipts uh, collected, there's still gonna be a profit margin in there for them. That's one example on where you can communicate not only how that compensation structure can look, but then how you're going to do it, right? I'm going to work on increasing my second pair of sales from this to this. I'm going to increase my annual uh, annual contact lens sales from this to this. I want to increase my uh, my uh, optical capture rate from 35% up to 50% or from 40%. Like, bring these ideas to the table because I promise you it will be much more well received by the practice owner than if you're just asking for a raise just because you want to keep pace with inflation. That's my perspective and how I'd encourage you to think about that as well. Which kind of translates again into know your numbers and what I'm talking about here is going to be applicable on the associate side like I was just talking and how you can be equipped with the KPIs, the key performance indicators that you can control as an associate. And if you're a practice owner listening right now, understand that the metrics of your practice is the pathway to profitability in your own personal financial plan. Any practice owner that tells me, um, or I guess to say it in other words, I really shy away from working with practice owners that won't discuss the practice financials with me because in order for me to address them on the personal side of things, we first have to know what's, what's going on in the business because if we can manage the profitability in the business, that helps us translate the dollars in the profitability that's going to come home to their personal side. So you have to know the numbers. You, we have to understand that the key at the end of the day to any practice is the predictability of future cash flow. That's all we're managing to. That's how we build enterprise value in our business so that when you think, beginning with the end in mind, 10 or 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, when you're thinking of selling this practice and you look at a willing buyer, all they care about is the predictability of future cash flow. So know your numbers, know how to manage to those numbers so that, again, at the end of the day, a rising tide lifts all ships. So again, one example of this is understanding your debt service coverage ratio, which is your net annual net operating income. It's the bottom line on your profit loss statement divided into your total debt service. This is one example where not knowing this number can actually create a financially unhealthy practice because when we look at the profit loss, 
total debt service is not necessarily built into that equation. The only debt number that shows up in your profit loss is the amount of interest that you have paid. But any debt that you take out in a practice is basically you're just accelerating future profits into today's numbers because you as a, as a practice owner are going to have to service that debt at some point in the future. So knowing your debt service coverage ratio is an important number, one of many to understand the financial profitability and the financial health of your practice so that if and when you get to the point of offering partnership, succession plan, that we know that the practice that we're buying is financially solid and a good practice to buy. Number nine here, leverage your most precious commodity. 168 is one of my favorite numbers. It's one that I continually try and remind myself on a daily and weekly basis. It's the number of hours that we have in a week. And my team will tell you, this is one area that I consistently struggle in, but I'm getting better every day, right? It's understanding that um, the, as your success grows and as the practice grows and as you as an optometrist grow, what you will find is that with more time, you can make more money, but with more money, you cannot make more time. So continue to stay focused on what, what I would consider to be your RPAs, your revenue producing activities. And this is more applicable to ODs as you think about the transition from working in the practice as a clinician to working on the practice as a practice owner. And find yourself asking this question when you're looking at your laundry list of to-do of to do list. This kind of happens in the messy middle from practice ownership when I talk to ODs that, that have an admin day, right? Be militant in how you're spending your time and the tasks that you're spending your time in the practice and ask yourself, is what my hourly wage is worth, right? What does the net income of the business pay you for taking that economic risk of starting the practice and owning the business and providing jobs to everybody that you employ? Whatever your hourly wage is, ask yourself the question, is the task that I'm doing right here the best use of my time a revenue producing activity, could I pay someone a lesser wage than what I'm paying myself right now to do this task? And is this going to be a repeatable task, right? If it's something that's going to have to be done over and over and over again, it might be better to offset that. One of the perfect examples of this, the low hanging fruit is payroll in a practice. I have talked to a lot of practice owners that spend more time than they think that they do running payroll and all of the associated tasks that go with payroll. Oh, Adam, it's only 15 minutes every two weeks. Oh, Adam, it's only 20 minutes every two weeks. And then it's the 941s, the quarterly tax returns. And then it's the W-2 creation. And they're working with their CPA, but they're still the back and forth. Look, that's one area, one example where it's, uh, I want to say death by a thousand cuts, but it's one of those things where what you're actually spending your time doing versus what you think you are, there can be a decent delta there. So understand how to leverage your most, your most important commodity. And certainly, uh, last but not least, understand how to evaluate an advisor. I'm, 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 I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. I know that there's not gonna be the opportunity for us to have the privilege of sharing in conversation with, with ODs around the country. So understand how to evaluate an advisor, trust your gut. And at the same time, when you're doing that, also understand and ask the question, do they have the legal obligation to work in your best interest? If you're gonna ask an, if you're gonna ask an advisor one question, ask them if they will be able to put in writing the fact that they have the legal obligation to act as a fiduciary. Ones that do hang their hat on it and are proud by that, we do for our clients as well. We have no affiliation, we have no, um, and any other advisor that acts in that fiduciary capacity has only the legal obligation to serve their clients well. So make sure that you understand, ask good questions. We have um, tools that we can that we can share if anybody's interested. We can, we can provide those uh, to the platform here and, and, and give you that opportunity to, to ask those questions, but make sure that you are being diligent, that you are being uh, methodical and, 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 and intentional about the decision-making process as you're looking at hiring as an advisor. Because from an accountability standpoint, from a tough love standpoint, it's one of the things that we really try and, drink, and bring to the equation with our relationships. And that's it, period. It's understanding the metrics of the business, understanding the wealth building potential that you have as an optometrist and how you can utilize that for only your interest to create the wealth that you want to live your life on purpose. And so I know this was a lot of information. Like I said, I keep thinking about that first slide in, my, uh, uh, in this presentation. We're drinking from a fire hose here. A lot of information in a short amount of time. But again, I appreciate everybody taking the time. If you're interested in learning more, you can grab your phone, uh, click on that QR code. It'll take you right to the 2020 uh, platform there where you can find out all the other information that we provide to ODs free of charge. Our whole intention here is to provide optometrists around the country with the education, the information, and the knowledge that they need to make those well-informed decisions. So uh, that'll take you right to right to a page where you can select whatever, whatever podcast platform you listen to. All of our information here as well uh, is 
is available. So thank you so much for having me on today's presentation. I hope this has been a great investment of your time, not only in just this presentation, but in the eyes on curriculum in general. So again, Adam Shmela, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the program.